Africa's elephants are again under siege, slaughtered in their hundreds of thousands, like the rest of the continent's wildlife, targeted for a trade steeped in violence and greed. These wildlife crises in Africa are wonderful examples of poor, rotten leadership. The main question here is, are we really interested in saving elephants? With poaching on the rise, their survival is under threat. And as the slaughter spreads from Central and East Africa into Southern and South Africa, conservationists warn of an ivory avalanche soaked in blood. The avalanche has arrived. and mountains of granite, their contours resembling Mozambique's endangered wildlife. This is Nyasa, the largest province in Mozambique. It is from this region that we will conduct the second part of our investigation into ivory poaching. We will be traveling to the Nyasa Reserve and to the remotest parts of Mozambique bordering Tanzania. 20 years ago, it was what probably saved the elephants and the rhino and the wildlife up there is that it was so remote. That remoteness now is actually working against Nyasa. This is where the poaching and trafficking of wildlife is reaching pandemic levels. In Tanzania, the elephant population is down from 145,000 in 2005 to 50,000 in 2014. The worst affected areas are, of course, the Salu Game Reserve um, and what's called the, the, the Salu Corridor, which runs southwards into Nyasa. Nyasa, again, you go back 2006, the statistics show about 21,000 elephants. Um, the most recent reports saying that's probably 40% of those have gone. They, you know, you're down to about 11, 12,000 elephants now. Those that have been put Ian Mishler is a conservationist, journalist, and filmmaker who has extensively documented poaching in both Mozambique and Tanzania. He accuses political leaders of not acting decisively on the scourge. You have ministers or presidents um, making bold statements, but nothing gets carried out. There are a number of politicians who have been named publicly in Parliament, all members for constituencies around the edge of the Salu Game Reserve. The then Minister of the Environment, Kakasheki, named them. Not one of them has been prosecuted. Today, levels of poaching in both countries are now the worst they have been since 1989, when the ivory trade was banned. You get shooters, you, you get porters, trackers from Tanzania. And the local people have uh, a very close relationship with Tanzania, so there is a lot of movement of people between Mozambique and Tanzania. And if, if you also look at the border, which is more than 300 kilometers, and it's, not, it's a porous border. The ivory is transported along roads and past villages, past the savannah to the sea, on motorbikes, the bigger stashes in minibus taxis or trucks. It is transported across the Indian Ocean by dhows and boats from Mozambique to Tanzania and Zanzibar, and then onto Asia via the Middle East. The Tanzanian poachers, they take the ivory directly to Tanzania, and uh, they use the Doma Road until Dar es Salaam Harbor, and from there they export it to China. But once you start getting into Dar or Tanga or to Zanzibar, then the more sophisticated members get involved. And what's interesting is often you have a transfer of a, an African being in charge to someone who's an Asian or someone of Middle East descent um, and usually someone who has good experience with living and working in Africa. I'm on the northwestern side, so I'm bordering the hotspot Tanzania. The other guys are here on the Lugenda side, which is more Cabo Delgado, and that ivory moves through to here to Pemba and onto Chinese ships and things, and there's, the ports are very sort of porous here. So we are in Mozambique, except in Cabo Delgado province, where several uh, containers with timber and ivory have been shipped out of Mozambique. Example, we have a case which was uh, reported last year about uh, several tasks and that timber about to be shipped to Cap Delgado and they were seized by the Mozambican police and the people of the Mozambican rail station. Most of the illegal shipments leave the harbor without being checked. 
those are the guys that have to grease the palms of the police chief, um, the port authority, the customs authority, maybe even the ship's captain, um, even a magistrate. You've probably got a politician or two, a minister that's involved as well. There have been significant busts at Pemba Harbour. For example, in 2011, a container filled with timber about to be transported to China was found with several tons of ivory smuggled inside. If you look to timber issues, somehow you look to ivory issues as well. One of the Chinese companies implicated in the 2011 bust is Morfidi. It is currently under investigation by the Environmental Investigation Agency. The owner, Lu Chaoying, has allegedly close ties with the Minister of Agriculture, Jose Pancheco. Morfidi is also allegedly cozy with the police commissioner of Cabo Delgado, Dora Manjati. She has been accused of corruption in the Mozambique media. The Mozambican police commander in Pemba province allows people to take products such as uh, ivory and uh, rubies to Mozambican airport and uh, Mozambican harbor. Neither Mr. Chao Ying, the Minister of Agriculture, nor Commander Manjati responded to special assignments requests for an interview. No one was convicted for the 2011 bust, but six government inspectors were suspended for their involvement. We went to Pemba Harbor to inquire whether the six suspended officers had eventually been charged. But the Port Authority could not or would not provide further details. Our investigation into ivory poaching with Mozambican journalist Estacio Valoy began in Pemba, in the province of Cabo Delgado. We visited traditional villages bordering the Karimba National Park, and we tried to infiltrate poaching syndicates, risking arrest should we be caught. There we had learned of three major reasons for the increase in poaching. Poverty, competition for habitat, and the increasing demand for ivory. But the fourth reason the poaching scourges at the levels it is today is the complete and utter lack of political will to fight this crisis. This is a question which uh, Philim should uh, answer because last time we tried to ask them, they gave us, uh, how could they say, the answer which they gave us did not really satisfy us. From Pemba, we are heading to the Nyasa Reserve to further investigate official complicity in the scourge. Covering 42,000 square kilometers, Nyasa Reserve is twice the size of Kruger Park. We have traveled 572 kilometers from Pemba along some of the ivory smuggling routes. We will be based at the Nyasa Reserve headquarters. There are thousands of hidden weapons, the aftermath of Mozambique's liberation and civil wars. I think during the last three months, from September until now, uh, they could recover about, uh, I think it's 150 tasks. And, uh, number of arrests as well. And there are obvious links between syndicates operating in Cabo Delgado and Nyasa reserves. But in the smuggling of both ivory and weapons, the Nyasa reserve is better equipped to deal with both. If you look to the scouts in the Nyasa National Reserve, you compare them with the scouts in Cabo Delgado, is a huge difference in terms of, let's say, goods, equipment, even to some extent, we had scouts from Kabilega that we trained uh, in, in the reserve just to see if we can get the same standards of operations in terms of skills and abilities of the scouts. The scouts in the Nyasa, they're still looking for weapons. They need weapons because uh, the poachers are using automatic weapons. They use AK-47 and uh, the scouts from the National Reserve they don't have it. Yes, that's um, uh, one issue. But you can see the source of the fire. Mozambique has been there. Like this year, we have confiscated 10 firearms and more than 658 uh, round ammunition. Some of those, they came from Tanzania, obvious, and some, they came from the ex-militaries. 
uh, we do work with the uh, uh, government intelligence and security. So we are trying to link up all the institutions that can be combating the poaching. But despite these initiatives, poaching is still on the rise. The problem of elephant poaching has been just increasing in those years. Uh, looking at our aerial count results that were in 2011, where we recorded more than 2,627 two, two carcass. And on the following year, we had a reduction by 50%, but this year it's picking up again. Soon after arriving at the Nyasa Reserve, we are informed about the arrest of two men caught in possession of AK-47s, a community leader and his son from a nearby village caught in an undercover sting operation. One of our team, a team of scouts, we left to, the, to one of our village. One of our members pretend, pretended to be a Messiah citizen. And uh, he spoke with this man, alleged to buy rubies and uh, other minerals. And the son of this man, he told him that he has a weapon and that he was selling this weapon, this AK-47. And that the scout, undercover, asked him how much he was selling. And he told him he was selling the weapon for 6,000 men. As we know, poachers here, they use automatic weapons or AK-47. And that from there, uh, we decided to take the weapon. This is the main link which uh, we had. Yet the men insist they are not poachers and were merely trying to sell the weapons for food. He's trying to assist to get rid of this guy. So to me, he's a good man. And his son? His son is also, they were getting rid of the guy because they didn't want him. They remind me of the men we interviewed in Cabo Delgado, the foot soldiers driven by poverty and opportunism with only a partial understanding of the chain of command governing sophisticated organized crime syndicates. Yet these two men allegedly received their weapons from two of Mozambique's alleged poaching kingpins, Paolo Nienji and Antonio Bernardo. Both Nienji and Bernardo have been arrested several times for poaching and weapons possession. Bernardo is linked to poaching in the Kruger Park and Nyenge allegedly has close ties with Tanzanian syndicates. Both have been released several times, allegedly by bribing officials at the Makula police station nearby. We learn they have been rearrested. We have uh, Paul Nyenge and a uh, number of others that have been operating in uh, organized syndicates in Poche. But it is one thing to make arrests, it is entirely another to secure a conviction. In June of this year, we had the conservation law which was approved by the Parliament of Mozambique, which encouraged uh, the scouts to bring more evidence and uh, or results because uh, people that will be killing elephants and other protected species, they will face a jail of eight years and on top of that will be fines. Mozambique has just changed the law for, since the beginning of time in Mozambique, poaching was not a crime, it was a misdemeanor punishable by a fine. It now has been turned into a crime and has been signed by the Council of Ministers, but apparently it's still not going to be put through until next year. We catch these guys, we put them in the police station and they're gone. They get released. The following day, we visit the Makula Jail, just outside the Nyasa Reserve. Nienji and Bernardo have been charged and are awaiting trial. Estacio confronts Nienji about allegations of bribery at Makula Police Station. Depois, de, depois do trabalho, como nós não tínhamos aqui juiz, eram transferidos para o Distrito de Maroma, onde existe o tribunal. É lá onde tudo é tratado. Again, we leave with more questions than answers. And 14 days after this interview, while awaiting trial, Nienji and Bernardo escape from Makula police station. They escape out of a small window shortly before their planned transfer for trial.
the two men arrested for weapons possession remain in jail. Bernardo was subsequently recaptured. He is currently under police guard in a hospital with a broken leg. Nienji remains a fugitive and is believed to have sought refuge in Tanzania. This morning, we received the alarming news that after arresting a suspected poacher trying to cross the border into Tanzania, rangers from the Nyasa Reserve were ambushed and assaulted yesterday by Mozambique's border police. Deep involved, let's say, because we have some weapons from the police border patrol being used by poachers. If a police border patrol somehow allowing people to cross the border with illegal products such as timber, ivory, and also other products. This is further confirmation of the web of complicity between officials and the poachers. We are going to follow the Nyasa scouts to the village of Chamba along the border where the assault occurred to find out what exactly happened. I've been implicating the border police in poaching since they arrived in my area three years ago. Jamie Wilson is a professional big game hunter and safari operator. He owns one of the nine concessions in Nyasa and his lodge is close to the village where the assault occurred along the border. Suddenly I've got 20 AK-47s and 20 border police at times in my area and they are renting their firearms out to the poachers. The drive to Chamba takes over six hours through rugged terrain along the Ravuma River. It forms the border between Mozambique and Tanzania. Along the way we see some of the destruction wreaked on Mozambique's wildlife habitats and natural resources illegal timber logging and bushfires causing extensive deforestation, forcing the wildlife to forage for food near human settlements. This has exacerbated the competition for habitat and the conflict between man and beast. You have to go to the community and uh, tell them how important is to have elephant, how important to maintain not to cut trees, uh, example in Mozambique, how important uh, is to control uh, uh, how the people are fishing, for example, and uh, education is required for this kind of issues. Mozambique is a country rich in natural resources, but it is being ravaged by greed. Not only is poaching disrupting the ecosystem, it has also caused severe changes in traditional animal behavior patterns. The elephants are becoming ag aggressive. They sometimes uh, move away from the bush, the communities. This year we had uh, two people injured by elephants, those were wounded elephants. Last year we had two people killed by elephants. Three, four years ago in my area I'd see several hundred elephants a day, during the day, and calm with calves, cows and calves and things. Now they've been mostly nocturnal, because they're actually very scared to go out and they hide in the thickets at night. But I wouldn't say they're the same as, as humans, but they do have a very intricate family structure, yes and they do get very stressed and they can pass that stress on over many hundreds of kilometers. Although poaching elephants is prohibited, hunting them is allowed. My quota, for example, is very low. It's two elephants per annum and we We've had lost a lot of elephants now, we still do have a lot. And that's nothing for what the benefits you get from that. We have really uh, good operators, not such as just pro professional hunters. We have 12 tourist operators, of which nine are uh, hunters. They are participating very positively in the anti-poaching. They employ scouts, they employ local communities. They also f do part of our informant network and they also help us getting good results. Uh, you have a knife uh, which is sharpened to places. From one side, this concession are allowed by the government, from where the government collects benefits. But on the other side, you also have poaching going on. You have uh, several flights going up and down. So my question will be also, what kind of control does exist in that side? Trophy hunting is controlled by the Ministry of Tourism concession revenue is supposed to go towards conservation.
The trophy hunting operators are also expected to provide anti-poaching and infrastructural development to villagers like Chamba. Does trophy hunting contribute to economic activity? Yes, it does. Of course it does. But is it a significant contributor? No, it's not. Villagers like Chamba remain mired in poverty. They have no schools, no clinics. The hunting issue, of course, is, is in some ways rubbed salt into those wounds because those villagers can't take a small antelope to feed their family, but some wealthy foreigner can come along and shoot that animal for fun, and that's okay. Um, you're not allowed to trade in the product. Sport hunting allows it for one time to the, to the hunter, and he may not give that to anyone, he may not sell it, he may not carve it up. Unlike Cabo Delgado, most of the communities in Nyasa are Muslim. Elephant meat is therefore taboo. Apart from a small quota of animals for ritual purposes, they are prohibited from killing wildlife. They see animals purely as either a problem or food. That's how they're brought up, and that's how those, they, they live in harsh conditions, the crops they grow. In one night, an elephant or a hippo can come and wipe out that whole family's six months of half, you know, gone. But then they see us with um, wealthy Europeans and Americans hunting and whatever. They have to get more slice of the pie. But as our experience in Cabo Delgado has taught us, even when communities are given permission to shoot problematic elephants, there is often a fine line between protection and poaching. On the way to Chamba, we witness firsthand the effect that poaching has had on the wildlife. The rangers have noticed several lionesses feeding off a carcass. On closer inspection, we see it is a young elephant caught in a poacher's snare. It has been disemboweled and ripped apart by the lionesses while it was still alive. The lions could return at any moment to reclaim their prey, but lions do not traditionally eat elephant. It is because of poaching. They would never really before attacked elephants, but now they get a lot of abandoned calves and they say, wow, this is easy, I can do this. We have finally arrived in Chamba, the village bordering Tanzania, where the Nyasa reserve rangers were ambushed by border police while they were trying to arrest a poacher. His illegal bounty was not filled with tusks, but meat. One of the Nyasa rangers explains while Estacio translates. We asked him, who gave you this meat? And they said, the police border patrol gave me this meat. Once the police border patrol heard about uh, the way, police patrol border gave us this meat, then they started to ambush them. They were handcuffed and they were taken to the police border patrol headquarters from where they could manage to come back. Are they going to lay a charge against the border police who did this to them? We're going to give a full report uh, to our headquarters, then they will know what to do exactly. A meeting is called to discuss the abuses by the border police, not only against the rangers, but also against the Chamba community. They have had enough. One by one, they recount details of harassment, intimidation and assault by the officials meant to protect them. The border police arrived and they shot their guns into the air and assaulted us in order to prevent us from giving information that they are involved in poaching. The community knows the poacher. He was here in this community. After what happened today, the poacher left the community. We don't know where he is now. We can see that tensions are running high. We sense they could explode at any moment. The following morning, we depart from Chamba and head back to Nyasa headquarters. Along the way, we encounter a site that will forever remain imprinted on our memories. Oh, stop, 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 stop. A site that sums up the horror of the scourge. The elephant calf, caught in the poacher's snare, stripped of its tiny tusks, has been strung up in a tree by hunters as leopard bait. It looks like the victim of a lynch mob. Have we just caught a glimpse into the fate of the elephant? To be wrecking havoc on elephants and rhino is actually a very dumb, illogical thing to do. Let's appeal to our own instincts of survival 
and say, folks, we need to do this for our own health, for our own survival. 